Okay, welcome back. Uh, let me just uh, remind everyone to sign the attendance uh, sheet outside and uh, the meeting is being webcast and it is being recorded. Um, this afternoon, we're, I guess, gonna continue with our discussion of the pieces of the JAP report and right, First, uh, we're going to talk about the exposure assessment and that uh, the exposure scenarios. And I guess we'll start with a presentation from uh, Serge Das Gupta from Versar. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Serge Das Gupta. Um, I'm an environmental engineer at Versar Incorporated, and I'm here today with my division director, David Bottomore, who's sitting out there. And uh, the presentation that um, I'm going to do today is going to include um, a basic overview of the steps that Versar has done to uh, calculate um, scenario-based aggregate human exposures to phthalates. All right, um, I'm going to talk about uh, the objectives and then uh, delve a little bit into the overall background, uh, then move on to the methodology that we have used for this particular task. Um, I'm going to show you some Excel uh, workbooks, which you know will give you guys an idea of some of the preliminary results that uh, we have so far, uh, and then finally we can talk about uh, the next steps of the future course of action. Um, so the overall objective uh, of this task is uh, for us to uh, determine or to calculate um, scenario-based um, human exposures to a variety of phthalates. Um, what makes this process complex is that it's, it's truly a multidimensional issue because you have a variety of phthalates, these phthalates are present in a variety of media, and we have different exposure routes. Um, so to capture you know, the relationship that exists between all these and to look at how the exposure varies between different populations is, is definitely uh, a challenge. And that is what we are uh, trying to, to achieve over here. Um, the way we are going ahead with this is, is what we call, you know, we are focusing on the forward method, uh, where we look at, you know, the, uh, the concentrations and the exposure factors, put them in, 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 in an equation and come up with an exposure estimate, as opposed to the backward method, which is uh, trying to, uh, uh, you know, measure the amount of phthalate that's present, present in, in, in blood and urine, so on and so forth. Um, in the background, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the exposure routes that we have looked into um, and how these relate to phthalates present in the different media. Uh, the list of phthalates that we have uh, focused our research on so far, uh, the different uh, subpopulations that we are dealing with, and, and uh, uh, a few sentences about uh, general data requirements. Um, so this figure out here kind of gives you a, a big picture of, of the different um, exposure routes that we have come across so far um, in dealing with this task. As we know, the three main routes are inhalation, dermal, and oral, but between them we also have certain sub uh, subgroups or sub uh, you know exposure routes, if you might call it so. And um, the next figure kind of gives you an idea of how these are related to the different media. Um, before I get into the details, I would just like to say that this is uh, an evolving process. Uh, we are finding out more about the complex relationships between the different media that the phthalates are present in and the exposure out. So this is not, you know, uh, the complete thing. This is just a, 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 a picture.
picture of what we have found so far. We are still doing the research and this is going to get uh, you know, corrected as and when we find out more information. Um, but just, just to give you an idea, um, for example, under inhalation, you know, we, we've, we've seen that a variety of media would contribute to uh, phthalate human exposures, personal care products, environmental sources like dust, soil, uh, water, and of course the use of household products. And, and, and the list kind of goes on um, as and when we try to look at a particular exposure out, uh, we, we do research and we determine that you know, the data comes from a variety of media. And so the idea is to compile all that and then come up with a single exposure out for a particular given uh, you know, route media combination. Um, some basic guidelines. Uh, these are the list of eight phthalates that uh, we have focused on. Uh, the population groups, the idea was to first focus on pregnant women and women of childbearing age. Uh, some of the results that I'm going to uh, discuss today are, are, are only going to be for this subpopulation. Uh, the next steps, of course, are going to focus on infants, children, and then adults. Um, we decided to come up with a qualitative estimate of the, the quality of the data. In other words, uh, classify it as, as high, medium, and low. And this is based on some basic guidelines, and, and I will talk a little more about that in, in the subsequent slides. As far as statistics are concerned, um, what we've observed is we have a variety of uh, concentration data for a particular phthalate in a particular media. So the idea here is to come up with the mean as well as the 90th percentile value for those concentrations and then combine it with the exposure factors to come up with uh, exposure estimates. Uh, moving on to the methodology, as, as I mentioned some time back, the idea is to use the forward method uh, to, to, to calculate aggregate human exposures to phthalates. Um, so this task can clearly be divided into two groups. Uh, one is uh, the group that focuses on compiling concentrations, phthalate concentrations, and the other that focuses on obtaining the exposure factors. Um, as far as concentrations go, uh, our efforts uh, have mainly included, uh, you know, we've received a lot of data from uh, CPSC um, we've also looked at, we've obtained the data from um, a detailed report that we submitted to uh, CPSC back in February of 2009. Uh, and we've also been doing some additional uh, literature search. Uh, as far as the exposure, exposure factors, again, uh, we've received some data from CPSC. Uh, and most of the concentration factors that we hope to find would be in the exposure factors handbook that WORSAR has uh, compiled for EPA. And of course, uh, additional literature research, for example, outstanding papers like uh, Warmoth, really it has a lot of useful information. Um, I'm sorry. Um, I think Versar was uh, involved in this task a couple of years back where uh, we looked at uh, exposure factors uh, for a variety of uh, subpopulations, you know, uh, infants, children, women, and, and, and we came up with uh, uh, factors that were all compiled in, in, in a handbook. And this is, I believe, it is yet to be peer reviewed, but it's uh, you know available on the website, EPA website. Uh, and I believe the, the the version is 2009. Is that right? Okay, okay, okay. Um, Sorry, uh, but what is it? Oh, it 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 basically contains the the factors. 
uh, exposure to humans. By how much air you breathe, how much water you drink, yeah, yeah. how much you Okay, weigh. examples, all right. So it, it could be right. things like skin surface area, exposed skin surface area, the number of times you know, a particular product is, is, is used, uh, what, what percentage of the population you know, would be exposed to that thing, the fraction of that particular chemical you know, absorbed or fraction exposed, those, those sort of things. Yeah, how much food you eat. Exactly. By food exactly. type, all the way down. Consumers, non-consumers, you name it, it's Correct. all there. Yeah, and there's a yeah. children's exposure factors handbook. Yeah, a separate uh, handbook for Child children. Yes, yes. Yeah, and this, the 2009 is is an update. I mean, it's um, there was at least one prior edition, maybe two. Two. 97 was. <coughs> is the latest? Well, or? 90 is the finalized version before this one. Yeah. And there was one in the I believe in the 80s. Okay. So basically, what it provides for, for, for all of us is, is information that since we don't have individuals who have basically had exposure assessments done for phthalates, it provides data to take you from source to human receptor, what the exposures could be based upon inhalation, dermal uptake, uh, ingestion, and then calculate a... Um, an exposure for these media and then use uh, daily intake, you know, by intake rates to figure out a daily intake value which can be comparable to what you're doing. And you take it by dis different media or different routes and you can basically sum up whether it's from, from ingestion, ingestion of food versus inhalation. So you come up with an intake value that is accumulated. I think you should have defined what aggregate exposure is. It's aggregating all the exposures across different routes that can enter the body, and then you have measured or estimated values for each one of those routes to compare against the total versus compare against what you come up with in a biomarker. So, just a point of clarification. So, all of those things have distributions to them. So, yes. do you, are you summing the median? Are you summing extreme values? Do you do both? But I forgot what the what we rely. What, what, what do we? Agreed upon. Uh, what we agreed upon was to use the, the mean and the 90th percentile values for the concentrations only. As far as the exposure factors go, we are normal. We are primarily going to focus on the mean values. But why the mean and not the geometric mean, since you would expect skewed distribution? And why the 90th instead of the 99th? Or? Yeah, the exposure, as you know, is like an art more than a science. You know, and, and a lot of times it, I think we strive for something called a high end, high end of exposures, which is defined as between the 90th and 100th percentile. Some people like to try to get at what the 95th is. Um, I think it's more of an art. Typically, when you have exposure factors and then you have exposure media and then you have multiple pathways you, you really it's it's your opinion as to what is a true high end you know the real population not the hypothetical or theoretical upper bound so typically what they do is they they choose maybe like a high end with regard to exposure media but then take average concentrations and that's the art of getting at a high end of an exposed but it's it's to answer your question is probably no. You know, there's no proven rule of thumb as to the best answer. It's more of an art. Yeah, because you can go to the extreme by saying highest concentration, highest of this, highest of that, highest of that, and you end up with a person who never existed, died before they were born. They used to, they used to do that, and then there was a push in the community to try to get at the real population. Yeah, I think and I... It's usually a combination of some mid-range central tendency values with some high end and and we all sort of agree that's the best way to go as long as you know. and actually I thought we were going to use uh, a high end concentration see what that does mm -hmm. and then in another calculation look at a high end frequency of use or that sort of thing so we're going to have 
both of two high-end values calculated by different means, different uh, methods. Contract, yeah, I yeah. That no, was... no, and in, and in fact, I mean, when we said well, mean, I mean, we uh, we meant an average value because depending on on the studies, mm -hmm. uh, people may only report a mean or a geometric mean or a or a median. So it, it we were using average as a generic measurement of central tendency. Okay. Um, yeah, but yeah, that that's a good point. But um, when we started researching the exposure factors, we realized that in some cases, it's very difficult to come up with a single number. Sometimes the number is there. Sometimes we had to kind of aggregate itself. Like for example, um, use of a lotion. We had values for face, for hands, for legs. So in some cases, we had to come up with you know a combined number so in those cases they themselves represent the the higher end um, just make sure you document all this yes yes I'm, I'm I'm going to show you some of the uh, spreadsheets which you will see that it's all docu well documented yeah. and and if you put it to what you've been using you know you use the, the uh, biomarker data which is usually a point estimate you know it's, it's the same sort of thing there's a little bit of artwork there's a little bit of science to try to come up with a daily intake Um, coming back to the, 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 the data quality, uh, again, this is something that is not really set in stone. We are, uh, this is an evolving process, but in general, um, what we decided to do was uh, focus mainly on U.S. data and data that, you know, has been uh, compiled in the last 10 years or so, and that would be classified as high quality. If for some reason that data is missing, we would then go and try and obtain European data. Uh, generally, the idea would be to obtain data from peer-reviewed journal articles. That would again uh, qualify as high quality. Um, and in some cases, the numbers might be really low. Uh, for example, you know, we just have one or two values for a particular phthalate found in a particular media. Uh, that could mean two things. One is the data could be sparse or limited, or it could also mean that really that particular phthalate is not present in that media. So we are going to make that judgment, and we will document that. Um, moving on now to uh, some of the, the preliminary results. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our, our primary goal was uh, to first focus on uh, the subpopulation, which was pregnant women and women of childbearing age. Uh, within that, we focused on three specific exposure routes. Uh, that would be inhalation, uh, dermal cosmetics, mainly personal care products, and direct ingestion, which is mainly you know food and beverages. So. The way we uh, did this task was for each general exposure route, we have three spreadsheets. The first spreadsheet um, has concentrations, concentration data only, and it provides details of you know, uh, all the, the data. And I will be showing you examples of you know, these spreadsheets that we've put together. The second would be exposure factors. And uh, as Paul had mentioned some time back, the way we've compiled it is um, for each exposure factor that we have come up with, we have a justification uh, or our comments as to what our rationale was to come up with those numbers. And finally, the third spreadsheet you know, combines these concentrations with these factors, plugs it in an equation, and then comes up with uh, an aggregate uh, exposure number or estimate. Um, From here, I'm actually going to uh, exit this presentation and then open up some of the, the spreadsheets. Yes, 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 yeah, I, I have them here. Thanks. Uh, what I'm first going to show you is um, the, the spreadsheet where we have compiled all the concentrations. 
and again this is not complete this is just you know has a good good amount of data but we are obviously you know adding to it um let me see so the way the data is arranged is you have um phthalates the different exposure routes you have a, a general media, and then you have a specific media. Uh, the specific media goes into the actual, the actual media there, there, you know, the concentration was found. This kind of um, gets into a little, little bit of detail. You have uh, the, the population. Now remember, in some cases, it clearly mentions that the data was collected for that population group. Uh, in other cases, it doesn't mention anything. So we are just going to assume that that, you know, it, you know, exists. Um, you have uh, a column for data qualifier, which, you know, some of the studies mentions what the data is. If it's a mean or a maximum or a minimum, whatever, we tried to document that. Um, these are the concentration values. These were the units that they were listed in, in, in the articles or uh, the documents that we looked at. Some of them mention the number of, uh, you know, readings or the records. It gives us uh, the location. We have the, the source. And then we have uh, the conversion factor, because the idea is to get all the concentrations in, in, a, in a single unit so that it can be aggregated or combined and then used in the equation. So we have conversion factors, and we have notes in some cases as to you know how we converted the units from you know um, one unit to the other. These are the new concentration values, the new units, and then we have some additional comments. Uh, the last column is is data quality, which um, you know we really haven't uh, completed because you know once we look at the data, we you know have to make some judgment calls and and decide uh, how to classify the data. But uh, this is really in it's it's almost like in the form of a database. So if you use filters in Excel, for example, if you want to look at one particular phthalate, the EHP, you can see that this is available in the following exposure routes, or rather, you know, humans could be exposed to this particular chemical uh, in all these different ways. Mm -hmm. Among this, if you want to, you know, look at, say, for example, inhalation, then you see that you know, these are all the different things where DEHP would be available uh, and humans could be exposed to it through inhalation. So this really gives you, you know, the big picture thing, but you can really drill down into the details using filters and it could give you specific answers. What we did from here was to split this data according to exposure routes. So in, today, in today's presentation, I have uh, ingestion direct, which is nothing but food and beverages, and then we have uh, dermal cosmetics, and then we have inhalation. So we split the data uh, and then combined it with uh, some of the exposure routes. So this is, I'm sorry, go ahead. That was a clarifying question. So I'm, um, maybe I'm, because I'm not seeing all the way across a row, uh -huh. but when you have multiple, like you had um, congregation household dust multiple times, mm -hmm. It could be. Uh, is it different kinds of household dust? Yes, different in sources. Different locations. Yes, different data sources, or it could be the same paper, but it could be collected at you know different locations in the U.S. So, but at the end of the day, are you going to come up with a single? Yes. Um, that where you were talking about the 90th percentile of the yes. average yes. of whatever Correct. that household dust was across whatever locations and whatever. Correct. The idea. Over. The idea is to combine these values for one particular phthalate for a particular media. So in this case, based on the question that you asked, what we would do is we would take all the DEHP values for inhalation uh, for household dust indoor, and we would come up with the mean of those numbers as well as the 90th percentile. Mm -hmm. And then we would use those numbers as, uh, you know, to calculate uh, exposure estimates. That's just from concentration.
That is just from concentration. But These if values. Gonna, if you're going to use a rate, you need to figure out for a woman what the mean rate is and what the men. And then, do you do you differentiate between a woman of pregnant of um, childbearing uh, age and then also pregnant women, or do you put them together? For, for it would be helpful to separate. Well, yeah. As of now, we have combined them. Um, but uh, well, I think the the reason being that at this level you can't find much in terms of data to that distinguish between the two. I mean, maybe inhalation rates and body weights, but, you know, other than that, uh, the concentrations are the same and so on. Yes, and the factors are not specific for pregnant women. Yeah, and, and, yeah, the factors aren't specific enough. I mean, there are some research papers, you know, where they have only looked at pregnant women and they have calculated concentrations. So that's clear cut. But for the most part, what they do is they just measure phthalate levels in, in different media. And, and the assumption is that all, everybody is going to be exposed. But do you use that as kind of a tier where the top tier is if, if there's data available for pregnant women, then that's the values you would choose. If not, then you would use, use well, or do you mix them? Well, the thing is that so far, there has, I think we have just come across just one or two studies where, you know, the data is only for pregnant women. So it's included over here, but, you know, the calculations also include all the other concentrations. So, I mean, we can, we, we can you know, categorize it. Um, it would just be a matter of, you know, selecting a subset from this and just saying that, you know, this is really, really specific because even the concentrations are specific only to pregnant women. Um, and, and, and the thing is, it, it would be easy to do that because I have that listed as the comments, as in this was collected only for pregnant women. So it would be easy to do that in the future. Can, can I ask a question? Please, from, please. from all I know, um, concentration data in media like this are not normally distributed. Uh, they're skewed. Mm -hmm. But I notice you use averages. Mm -hmm. Often you have bimodal distributions even. Right. Could you comment on that? Um, what we have done so far is um, we have tried to compile data from a variety of sources. And within that source, sometimes they list all the values or sometimes they just have one number. So the, for, to, to make it simple, the assumption is let's go with, you know, the 50th percentile or the, or the mean. And, you know, if there are specific studies which give us, you know, more detailed data statistics, then we will look into that. Because uh, we wanted to, you know, uh, not get bogged down with the details when it comes to one or two studies, because really there are very few studies that provide those, that kind of detail. The, the idea was to focus on the big picture. Um... Are there any, any? I have a question too. In terms of individual getting at that mean, some studies have large n, some have very small n. Did you treat each study as an equal? In other words, did you do it on a, a, a sample basis or did you derive your means on a study basis? Um, in some cases, no, we, we, we treated everything as equal. Well, in other words, the mean of study means or the mean, in other words, if one study had large n, yes, n equals yes, 100, yes, yes. did that study overwhelm everything else, all samples treated equally? No, n not so in what we have compiled. Mean of study means. Yes, yes, yes. And and that's a good point you raise because, you know, we came across that where some well, studies. You have one right there, 120 yeah. homes mm -hmm. yeah. versus yeah. one home versus, you know, so the 120 home study was basically treated equally to the study yes. at one home. Yes, yes. There's, there's arguments on both sides. We, when we yeah, did it for EPA, we did mean of study means. Yeah. So we didn't want one study to overwhelm everything. 
one other thing that we came across was um, in case, you know, if the mean was not specifically mentioned, what we did was if we had like min and max values, we included those. So the idea would be that, you know, we still have some, you know, representative numbers. You know, that's, it's a tough call because some people will report, you know, 100 measurements in the same room in the same house and, you know, that 101, well, they're all in Cape Cod, so should that be given that much more weight than the rest of the country? I, you know, I, I don't know. doesn't mean it's representative of the country. Right, right. So you have to, you know, weigh the two. Next document that I'm going to show you all is um, an example of uh, the exposure factors. And I'm going to uh, select, say, the dermal cosmetics. Um, so the way we have it here is we have uh, different phthalates and for each phthalate we have specific media and what we did was we collected uh, these are the exposure factors for example I'm going to just go through them, mass applied, and we have, you know, a, a brief explanation of how we got to that value. The skin surface area that that particular product is applied, and this is, this is all for women, pregnant women and women of childbearing age. I think in the Exposure Factors Handbook, they have a particular um, age. Um, and then the fraction absorbed, um, fraction exposed and then the, the mean body weight. And there is one other thing that we came across which actually was not part of the original thing and that is the fraction of the phthalate available in, in, in the product. That's something which you know, was not initially um, part of the, the equation. We, we put it in here but I, I guess we can talk about it a little later because if this is factored into the equation it would make a a, a big difference to, to the final estimates. Um, again, this is a sort of thing that we only came across for you know these cosmetics or personal care products. We don't have those numbers for some of the other media that we focused on. So for all the other media, the exposure factors really are independent of the phthalate. You know, it's like, but in this case, the factors vary from phthalate to phthalate and that's mainly because of this number of these numbers over here in this column so another comment though is that for skin applied you also have an absorption frac a fraction mm -hmm. right. whereas for inhalation and oral I guess you're assuming 100 percent absorbed uh, yes yes so that's sort of crossing the skin boundary is also well, like dermal is different than others how much do you assume crosses the skin boundary And which skin? Talking about facial? Well, it depends on the, the media, right? For example. Media? What do you mean by I don't understand the word media. Like, for that's, example. That's a source. Huh? That's a source. That's not a media. Nail polish is not a media. It's a source. Okay. Okay. Because media it means soil, water, food, but those are sources. I like getting confused. <laughs> All right, so you start with nail polish. Okay. That's the fraction. This is the moss applied. Okay. Uh, this is or the nail. skin surface area. Okay. And, this, you know, it's obtained from that particular study. And how much is absorbed? 25%? 25%. And 
four months know. study? Mm -hmm. and, and is that the only one? Yes, yes. This is, if, if we have warm month over there, that's just because we could not, come, you know, find that number mm -hmm. either in the exposure factors or the, the research okay. that we've done so far. You're actually looking at absorption, so you actually will come up with a milligrams per kilograms per day, depending upon how many times you apply nail polish, whether it's once, twice, or whatever. Then the fraction absorbed, which is, I mean, the fraction exposed, that's the fraction of the population. And um, this we obtained from one of the articles that we came across. Mm -hmm. So, but these these numbers are based on a, a woman using these products, not a not a professional who yeah. shampoos. That's right. That's right. Yes, and that's what this number is. So the assumption is, whatever uh, you know, ten percent of you know a woman. So what if we had a population, which I think we discussed at our last meeting, of um, women who are hairdressers, I mean, in some hair salons. Mm -hmm. They're going to have a heck of a lot more exposure to this stuff than anyone else. They'll have eight hours a day. Correct. So how do we factor that in as a highly exposed group? And they will be normally women of childbearing age. So that, I think that's a population we have to consider. Hmm? Matter to me what it is. It affects a child. I mean, a child. It doesn't matter if it's an occupational or a incidental or community. That into the discussion. I mean, not to say you'll have to do some calculations because that will be a high end group. Well, no, we did, we did talk about that, and, you know, we said that for the most part we're not looking at occupational, but that's one exception, or right. one that we, we would look that. at. I think we had discussed that at, our, yeah. at the May yeah. meeting. Yeah. Basically, the confluence of a high-end risk group, high-end concentrations. Okay, and um, the next one that I'm going to pull up is uh, the spreadsheet where you will see how the concentrations get combined. Can I just ask another? I'm sorry, absolutely. I'm just, like, Please. Clarifying question. So it seems to me there's a there's a sort of a level. To, I'm not used to this exposure. So uh, inhalation or, or uh, absorption, those things per person. But then the whole idea about behavior. Is a is another distribution. So, does this is this layered on top of? So mm -hmm. here's the absorption rate, the whatever you know for this kind of behavior. Now here's another kind of behavior. Is are you going to talk about the behavior part of this? Um, How these things could change. I mean, is happened, that a typical thing? That that's in in the, in the uh, exposure factors handbook. handbook yeah. They have does have those distributions. How many times I mean, you I, touch? How many? How frequently you do so, and if you don't, you have to find it. You'd look for particular studies, say how frequently a woman puts on her cosmetics during the day. All those things are part of exposure factors. And all of those things are incorporated here. Well, I don't know how many, but quite a few. And if there's not, we can always adjust it later on based upon what we find in the literature. So what we do a lot now with cosmetics is a big issue right now because with nanoparticles, nanoparticle exposures through cosmetics is a big deal. Um, and we're trying to figure out things like what well, frequency of women, which a woman applies it, um, reapplies it during the day, two, three, four times a day, and how much. So it's a, it's a, similar, a similar phenomenon. I think, the, I think you're, what you're getting at, maybe not, but another layer of what you're getting at is you have to define your exposed individuals. Right like a woman of childbearing age, and for her you will, you know, determine inhalation exposure and food exposure and nail polish. You know, you have to lay out, you have to define your exposed individual and what pathways you're going to consider for that individual and then add them up and then get a grand total. I mean, that's also part of what he's doing. He kind of skipped over that. 
assumption that we are defining, I assume you're defining X number of individuals that you're modeling. You know, you have, I guess you mentioned children in there and, you, and women of childbearing age and maybe a general adult or something. For each of those, there's a number of pathways. For each pathway, it's like average exposure factors combined with high-end media. You know, there's a whole, there's a whole several layers to think about for, Co for, for the individual. For comparison. How does it get the distribution in there? I mean, so you say, do you actually make assumptions about, okay, 5% of women wear a lot of makeup? Mm -hmm. Well, I, that's a, we're it's not, not, no. I think it, it depends what he's based doing. On data. It also yeah, depends it, on how he's structuring it. You could say that a woman who uses nail polish on, on this day, and maybe you're not, I don't know what they're doing, but maybe they're not saying over an average over a whole population includes 5% who use and 95 who don't use. He might just be saying a nail polish, a woman who uses nail polish. That's it. So you decide, let's, the next discussion is how frequently or how concerned are we. If we may not be concerned if it's 0.1% of the population, we may be concerned if it's, you know, turns out to be a high exposure and it's 20%. Of, you know, that's a discussion number two. That's down the line. But I, again, I don't know how we structure. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's part of the process. And I think as, you, as they present their results, the exposure scenario, maybe better to do that, um, will be weighed out rather clearly for the 95th, 90th percentile and the 50th percentile. So it'll all, you'll have a lot of data. Those that there will be a, dis a description of those kinds of assumptions, those kinds of distributions that you assumed and all of that. Yes, um, for each, as, as I mentioned some time back, for each of the factors, you know, we have, um, actually this one is, like for example, the deodorant, this is the assumption, so much is used, you know, so many times a day. So that's how we come up with, you know, this particular mass. Um, and there are other examples. Um, let's see. Those are four users, correct? Or is that over, is that the average including users and non-users? No, no, that's, that's users. That's four users. Yes, yeah, four mm -hmm. users. But then we also use a number which says the fraction of the population okay. exposed. So you are coming up ultimately with an average including users and non-users over the population? Well, this, no, because it gets multiplied by that factor, right, of only the, that percent of the population is using it, right? So wouldn't it be just for that population? You'll have to describe what you're using it for. That percentage of the population that is using it, you say that the percentage of the population that use it is X, and this is what it comes up with. If they don't use it, well, they don't get exposed. I think if you leave out that you're fraction right. of population exposed, if you leave that out, mm -hmm. you're modeling only users. Mm -hmm. Put correct, it in, correct. all yes. of a sudden yes. now you're averaging the mo you're modeling the average person. In other words, let's say your fraction using is 0.1. Mm -hmm. If you multiply your number by 0.1, what you're doing is an average, including one person who used it and nine who didn't. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. to users versus total population. May, may I ask what the, I mean, in real life, either you use it or, or you don't, mm -hmm. and you get exposed or you don't. What then is the benefit of modeling the average of, of an essentially binary thing? Because your biomarker data has no discrimination between users and no users either. Biomarker data is probably is. Yeah, because you don't know what they were exposed to. All you know is you have a biomarker level. If we only look at the user end, we may say, well, gee whiz, there's an awfully high number or maybe an awfully low number when you take into account the total population, which would be more representative of what you would get from the N. Haynes data or something of that sort. Because there's no discrimination in that between non-users, because you have no idea. Don't take that kind of information. Yeah, but at least we want to understand what the high end is, just in case there are people who are, you know, in, since we're trying to look at this from the standpoint of risk, we have to look at the users as being part of the example. When you want to compare it to the daily intake that you get from biomarker data, unless it's from the same group users, 
there's going to be a dichotomy between A and B, and I think we have to be able to recognize that, you know, you have to put in the total population to compare it to a non-discriminatory biomarker data set. I, you know, I think uh, our intention is to start with this, this average person, average for that population. Then once we have that, it's easy to go back and do these what if mm -hmm. things, uh, you know, to the extent that we have the time and energy to do that because they're, at some point I think we're going to have to calculate how many parameters go into this and it's going to be a big number and we can't look at all the permutations. I think the most important way to differentiate that is this is an aggregate exposure, so therefore you have to disaggregate it first and say which ones of, which of these exposure routes are important and which ones are not, and then you can go and yeah. look at the extremes and, yeah. and work there. Don't start with everything. Say, yeah. oh, well, gee whiz, you know, most, maybe inhalation turns out to be almost nothing. Yeah. If that's the case, well, you don't go worry about the extremes. If, to, if, uh, if ingestion turns out to be something, well, then you can go look at the extremes and look at that in, 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 a, in a logical way. And you can vary vice versa. Yeah. And if it's a case of users versus non-users, whatever that fraction is, if it's a small number, if it's 0.1, you know uh, that all you got to do is move the decimal place and you'll see what the dose is for the users only. I mean, it's... It, we we got to start somewhere. And and something similar to that is, you know, what I showed some time back was that column which has data which says this percentage of the product has this phthalate. Like, for example, deodorants, if it says only 40% of, you know, uh, the deodorants that have been measured or whatever have phthalates, then how do we, you know, address that? Because... I mean, everything, you know, if, even if we assume everything else makes sense, um, do we multiply that final exposure number by 0.4 or? Depends upon what you're trying to compare it to. Again, if we're looking at biomarker data, yeah. But if you're not, if you're looking at just star, well, it's a different story. Again, you got to be careful what we want to use it for comparison. Part of our objective here is to compare it with the intakes that are estimated based upon the biomarker data. Okay. So when you think of that, that you have to think about, well, if, in fact, most of your data is taken from large-scale studies, is that correct, Chris? Yeah, from um, NHANES and then from the data Shauna Swan. Right. So therefore, you're looking at population-based studies, and you're not looking at users. Now, so that's one example where you have to be careful. Of. That's why we said you look at the mean, or to look at an, an overall population distribution. Then, if we want to look at the extremes, because we will know there will be users out there, then we have to look at them separately. That's the way I'm looking at that because this is a model for what we're going to do with the toy. Toys are a big issue in their own right because each toy is different, and you'll have users, non-users, and odd way like mouthing all the time versus no mouthing at all. And you have to be sensitive to the fact that the tails are going to be. So, so what you're suggesting is almost like a tiered approach. This right. is like the tiered, yeah. a screening level assessment where we weed out, you know, the really critical ones and then do like a detailed analysis. That's correct. That's what we were discussing, but I think putting it in this forum now that you have this, these... Uh, otherwise it becomes totally impossible to do. Mainly, uh, I, I have another point. I would like to remind ourselves of the presentation Tom Burke gave to us, the silver book presentation, talking about uncertainties and oh, yes. uncertainty factors and so on. So currently what I see, the, the median and the 90th percentile is only content driven. It's driven by the content in the product. But I am and a lot of factors are related to it but these real these factors are numbers numbers without uncertainties so i would be interested in 
what is the uncertainty behind these numbers, like how much dust is actually ingested? Can be the range, what is the assumption behind it that you say out of one milligram of dust I inhale or I ingest this and that amount. So I would be interested in the uncertainties behind these factors, which we assume as one number, nothing more. Um, to answer that question, I, I can say that the numbers that we've used from the exposure factors handbook, a lot of those details are provided in those. Mm -hmm. And and I can, you know, uh, I don't have the uh, a copy of the, you know, factors handbook, but, but it really details. It, it provides a detailed description of, you know, what assumptions were there, what the, you know, uh, ranges of numbers are, and, and that sort of a thing. As far as, you know, the numbers which we've obtained from other sources, um, yeah, that's that's something we would probably have to look at. But are we talking about uncertainty or variability? Because I think we're talking, what you're talking about there right now is variability because those are real numbers. Let's say they have the range of ingestion of dirt by kids, all right? What they do is have a range of numbers that are the median and the high and the low end distribution of how kids ingest soil. But that does not account for the uncertainty in the individual estimates. I don't think we're ever going to get those. But we will be able to at least get the range of variability. Because each time you're asking a question, you're going back farther and farther into the database. And, you know, it's like with N. Haynes. What's the variability versus what's the uncertainty in the measurements? We don't know. You know it's, it's hard when you start taking data and you're moving farther and farther away from the source of the data. So let's either call it variability or uncertainty. In the end, it doesn't matter. Uh, right. The factors you use, are they mean factors? Are they the 95th percentile from this variability? So these factors, where, where are they're, they? They're mainly the means, the averages. The mean. Yes. What would you like to see included? The final numbers, you'd like to know what the, the variability is in some of the factors? for the ones with the crucial scenarios that are completed and reported. You want to have those, not the screening level, but at a much higher tier. Like, like I'm doing with Chris, it's easy if you have the, the formula and the numbers, you can play around with the numbers. So I would like to have some guess on, on the variability of, of, of the outcome. So that would be interesting, not only the median and the, the 90th percentile based on the, the content of the lates in, in, the, in the sources, but also the variability or the uncertainty in, in the exposure routes. But in the cases where there are multiple measurements, could it be a weighted sum instead of just a weighted average instead of a, just a straight out average of things that would account for the uncertainty of some of the numbers? Some numbers are more uh, when that's available. I don't know how often it would be available. But. If, if it is, you know, we would try our best to come up with uh, a reasonable estimate. Like I can, I can give you an example here. I mean, for example, the mass, let's, uh, mass ingested for milk. Okay. These are some of the estimates that we have. You know, we have different age groups and we have different grams per day of consumption. These are single numbers which I believe would be the means for those ranges. So again, we have documented that but we have just used one number. Uh, but if we were to go and try and find out you know, ranges between each subpopulation for one category only, really, really challenging. And, uh, yeah, I think, I think you have to, I think what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to do the screening and then based upon the screening results, if there's anything that shows up as being very, very important, 
then we may want to go back and do some variability on the ones that are really important because again some of this stuff is going to just be zero it's just when you have something that's apparently very high let's say the phthalates in beverages are very high well you don't want to just leave that you want to say well what's the range of not only you want to you, know, you just don't want to know who does drink certain beverages and don't but what the range of concentrations could be in those beverages because at least they'll give you a fair idea as to how, how variable it is. That's, I think that's the best approach. I mean, Trial I, and error. I mean, I can definitely guarantee that if you look at the spreadsheet, you will at least get an idea of you know where the data has come from and generally what it looks like. But then to get the specifics, we would have to refer to you know either the handbook. Uh, the handbook has you know some of that, but uh, for example, if it was obtained from a, a journal article, you know, the article might not have that information. If it had, we would have, you know, tried to at least put some notes or comments in our spreadsheet. Well, the spreadsheets will be tables and uh, Well, more like, yeah, uh, appendix. How about a DB, a CB? Yeah. How about a CB? <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, I think our approach to variability was to look at Average and night, average values, and then 90th percentile of the concentration in the medium, and 90th percentile of a, 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 a use factor like frequency. You know how often you use makeup or how much you use or something like that. And um, I mean that's yeah. what we decided to do. Really good idea. What's going? On. Biggest challenge is going to be for kids' toys. It's not product used by adults. There, you're dealing with behavioral issues being very, very apparent. You know, whether it's touching or whether it's mouthing, sucking, all those issues in kids' toys become um, a challenge. So, are these factors incorporated in this handbook too? Mouthing, sucking. Oh, yeah, that's in fact that's the children's handbook, which I think is already out. Correct. The children's handbook is incredible. I mean, they've done a very good job of accumulating all the data on children's activities uh, over the last 10, 15 years. Study. So that's I'd say that's a very robust data set. But Mike, let me come back again to what you said. So you introduced the second variable. So one variable is the, the content of delays in the products, and the second variable is the, the use characteristics. But we still have a lot of factors here related to other issues, like how much dust is ingested, what is the resorption rate from the dust, mm -hmm. all the dermal issues with the cosmetics. Mm -hmm. The data is very weak there. So I would prefer to, on some points, like dermal resorption of phthalates and dust ingestion have some impression on what is the certainty or uncertainty of these factors that you assume, just to get an idea. I think that's fine, but I think the first thing we do is because some of these routes may be trivial. Yeah, and but it depends on the uncertainty. No, depends on in some ways it's the uncertainty. It's on the concentrations in the media and the frequency of use or pick up. So some of these things will flow out. Some of them will be very, very highly variable. And you're right, we have to do it. But you have to have a triage or else you'll go nuts. But exactly as you said. But if we assume a factor very small, it falls out of the calculation per se. Ah. Two tells us that it's too small or too high. So I would like to see why we kick this out, sure. because we assume it is too small. Because that's a factor you made up, not made up, but a factor you somehow came to. So I would like to see the rational behind this factor and the uncertainty behind this factor. Mm -hmm. Because it's way more than just looking at what's the content of phthalates in the products and what's the, the use of the phthalates. It's much more the basic data I'm interested in. Break point, because the same held true with the biomonitoring data. The biomonitoring data, single point, space and time. 
exactly. How much, how much is that weighted by the day, the time of the day, and the events that occurred prior to that day when that value was taken? So we have to take all these things and realize there's going to be a large degree of uncertainty on both sides so we don't go, we don't go helter-skelter in either direction. Exactly. At the point we want to compare the data, the biomonitoring data, and the OSHA scenario data, and see whether the results are, are in accordance mm -hmm. or comparable. That's, that's why going with the mean is so much better for most of it, because biomonitoring data is, is population. But in terms of use, an individual, go to the extremes, and then be able to use that to say, well, what, how does this compare to the 90th percentile of the biomonitoring day, which could be some of those people who are in the extreme or may not be? Yeah, but the mean we are looking here is, a, is an assumption out of many factors, yeah. and I at least would like to see the factors yeah. behind this mean. Agreed. And what might be the uncertainty behind this mean? As, as you said, the biomonitoring data has some uncertainty, some major uncertainty. I think we should be aware I of. At, I don't think we're at odds. Uh, another thing is that that's been, Holger, that's been done in the literature. Uh, Catherine Clark's published now twice. One, one's coming out, and we're doing it as well. When you take the mean of your adult, which has all the pathways, and get a mean intake of phthalate, then look at like NHANES and take your central tendency, be it median, and work backwards and get an intake, and you compare the two total intakes, it actually is kind of remarkable how similar they turn mm -hmm. out to be. Right. So once you get there, then you say, okay, well now maybe we have something to work with. Let's see, you know, if we have that 90th percentile on food or 90th, you know, the heavy makeup user or something. I mean, you're never going to be able to probably verify that, if you will, but when you do those, central tendency calculations both on NHANES and on your forward calculation scenario. It's kind of remarkable how, how close they've come up, mm -hmm. I, you know. And that gives you some evidence. Mm -hmm. The problem with the, the exposure factors in the forward is that you have 25 different things to get worried about, whereas in NHANES, you know, you have the one biomonitoring and then maybe creatinine or, or something else to worry about. So it looks intimidating when you have lots of pathways and each one has like four factors in it, so. What you're saying is then, from your, from your experience, is that even in the face of, of these sorts of uncertainties, uh, when you play around with that, you may be within an order of magnitude of Oh, it's, it is, it is. And, and what's also interesting is that things, different researchers come up with similar findings, like food dominates DEHP. And you've done that with fasting studies, and you've done that with the forward-based calculations mm -hmm. when you've included DEHP in air and in dust and so on, and they fall out, and all of a sudden, the few studies with food, it, it shows to dominate. Right. So some, there's some similarities start coming through, and different researchers look at the same thing, mostly looking at central tendency, because you, you're right, you do, you do get lost in the fact that there are several pathways, and each pathway has three. So. You start picking, you start wondering about certainty and variability and which ones you pick, so you stick with central tendency on both ends. And they seem to match and they seem to show some interesting things. And once you get at that point, that's when you can go back and do what if scenarios and take a closer look and which ones dominate and when, how do we feel about that pathway and the factors that went into it and what can we do with it mm -hmm. and so on. Is that, yeah. is that sort of qualitative evaluation going to be part of, part of this? write-up, or is it going to just be the numbers? Are we oh, going no, to have it has to be end? part of the write-up. I mean, when it's they not. write this up, they'll have to explain mm -hmm. each one of the scenarios, and then within that, there's going to be a bunch of quali qualifying statements and also reasons why we get where we did. No, it's not going to be just a bunch of numbers. That, but, but also that would be the, illogical. But, but also the, the evaluation of it is making sense because mm -hmm. this, these numbers are similar to what these people got. I mean, that sort of qualitative evaluation. If their numbers are there, then it's, we can do it. But if they're not, you can't. There's always a first for some of this. I mean, this is all built upon years of experience with EPA has had with risk assessment on these 
aggregate exposure issues, lead as being a classic example and pesticides being the second classic example where they've been very successful in terms of being able to say, oh, gee whiz, you know, now we've done X, Y, and Z, Q is the only one that's left. With respect to lead, it was basically the elimination of lead from gasoline. Within five years, the blood lead levels went down to virtually zero. Why it happened? Well, the source was gone. Therefore, what was left? It was either paint or road dust that became the two dominant sources. And so, therefore, you really had a good understanding of what was causing the blood lead to be so high. Same thing with pesticides. The pesticide exposures have changed dramatically in the last 20 years. Why? Because the manufacturers have changed from broadcast spraying to crack and crevice to designer pesticides. And because of those things, the different influence from the different routes of exposure change, and where we now today look mostly at silly ways of applying pesticides versus pesticides that are in food as residuals, as being major sources. It depends upon where, you know, it's, it's good, it's very, very well designed and uh, approaches. So it's, it's not, this is not the first time it's been done. It's been successfully done before. It's just a matter of how you slice it to make it come out and give you a reasonable understanding of the situation. Here in phthalates, we have a lot, the biggest problem we have is we don't know all the roots. We have no clue. I mean, we've glossed over the root of adult toys, which uh, becomes an example of something that where we have to have CPSC do some studies. <laughs> and, what the, and then we, have, yeah, and what's the fraction of population that uses them? So those are issues that we, um, and don't have answers to. But clearly, these are things that we can be left as open question when we look and pair away the, the influence of particular sources as well as routes of exposure and as well as contact frequencies and use frequencies. So those all fit in. Sorry. No, thank you. <laughs> One other thing, my understanding. From uh, yeah, the last chap on phthalates, you, you did the investigations on the worst case scenarios like mouthing and chewing. So how does fit does that fit into now with this approach here? Because this is, in my understanding, not a worst case approach this way. So how would the data from here be comparable with, with the, the older data based on worst case assumptions on chewing and mouthing habits of children? You should also be able to model it from this data if you look at the upper percentiles. Sure. Yeah. So this would be one way I would like to have these models being calibrated. You can not only calibrate it to the mean, but also to the upper percentiles. So I think this would be a perfect approach to, to show it via this model. I'm not sure what you mean by the upper percentile. 90th percentile concentration. And then possibly the 90th percentile Mouthing of, certain, times. of certain other issues. Exactly. If you can give us a good example that you want put in there for calibration purposes, like, like, like the the model you used, you said that the the, tr uh, the children uh, might be. be chewing two hours on this and thing thing, it might contain forty percent of the phthalate. Right. So you should be able to to calibrate it this way. Well, at least see what the comparability is exactly. and whether or not the original calculation was reasonable or exactly. too too far mm -hmm. off on the end function. So this might be valuable information. That's, I think it's a very very good idea to add that one one. In or at least some examples for calibration, and I, I assume that might be that. That'd be good. Very good point. Oops. How about um, medications as a source? Uh, I, I have I, that. You, have you've that. included we that? Have okay. Yes. Yes. For dibutyl show, and diethyl. You, show you. you do. Okay.
Um, the data that we obtained, uh, we got it from CPSC, which I think was from FDA. And what they had was they had different drugs. They did not have the names. They just named it as A, B, C, D. Classic. Correct, mm -hmm. correct. And uh, they had the amount of phthalate that was ingested when you have that particular drug across different populations. So we use that number. Uh, let's see, hold on. I'm going to open up the spreadsheet which has um, concentrations for uh, direct ingestion. are some of the numbers um, have the populations mentioned over here drug type I think that's more um, there's one that there's a column yeah that would be under the comments there you right? go. yeah 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 Sixty-seven milligrams per day. Yes. Okay. And and we did not. We wanted to group everything as drugs, so we are going to get one number. But if you want to go back, you can see how we have obtained it. Th these are the classifications. So again, coming back to what you know, we suggested if we want to go back and maybe look at drugs in particular and try to, you know, subcategorize them based on, you know, their uses, we can easily do that. Right now, we just have one number, I mean, two numbers, the mean and the, the 90th percentile, and that would be combining all these together. Absorption? Uh, I believe we do. I think, I think we... Uh, doesn't matter. You take up. You take up hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Well, we tested it. It's absorbed hundred percent. The late. They are. Our plan was to calculate an internal dose, so the only adjustment for the thermal absor absorption. Inhalation, you're assuming 100%. It's kind of high. Oxygen, 70%. Well, think about. we did come across uh, a number in Warmoth, and, and we've documented it here. And what's that? This is for the fraction of the drugs. Sixty <clears throat> percent. Yeah. You want to make it as we've taken it as one okay. for, for the time being, but we've also yeah. made a comment saying that this is drug. I can see him trying to get up as close. To
Well, it, A, it's pretty high, and B, um, we're comparing to animal, most for the most part, to animal oral right. um, doses. Well, I mean, you're talking about, we're not talking about absorption of the drug, we're talking about absorption of the phthalate in the drug. Um, um, Yeah, yeah. And, and how it's carried? There are uncertainties there. Final analysis, when you're talking about <coughs> daily intake, is X, but then and This is very interesting because now we are right talking about what I pointed out we should talk about. The variability behind these factors. I mean, no, no, I, I totally Starting here yeah. and then drilling down. Yeah. We're yeah. starting with 100%. Yeah. Then you have to decide how far you're going to drill. But with, with the medications, we can be pretty sure there's a study from 2009 investigating butyl phthalate in medication, 17 volunteers, and the resorbed dose, dose was 78%. So we can roughly assume it's 80%, which is high, the high, rather high number. And this is my experience from my studies that uh, a very high percentage of the dose is really absorbed. What, what was that study? Um, 17 volunteers ingesting dibutyl phthalate containing medication. I can give it to you. Okay, okay. Yeah, I would definitely like to have a look at that data. Published 2009 in Tox Letters. Okay. Um, the last thing that I would like to show you all is, um, you know, the spreadsheet which does the final calculations where we come up with the final estimates. Um, I'm going to use uh, the cosmetics as an example. Um, what you will see over here is, so we have values uh, that we collect as far as concentration go, and then we also have exposure factors. Well, for them to come together, you know, you need to have data for a particular phthalate in that particular source. So what you see over here is, um, these are the phthalates and these are their sources. And so these combinations, we have calculated the, the exposures because we have valid data for both concentrations as well as exposure factors. So it kind of tells you over here the number of data points we had. And this is only for concentration. We have the average numbers over here and the, the 90th percentiles. And then we have the exposure factors that we've used and then these would be um, the average and the 90th percentile exposure estimates for those uh, phthalates and those media. And so straight away you can see, let's see, these two numbers 
I, and that would be in lotion, DEP, and, and fragrances. I'm, I'm showing you these because I've kind of gone through the estimates, and these are the relatively high numbers. The numbers in food as well as uh, inhalation are pretty low. If you're going to do comparability between the three, you have um, milligrams square centimeters per kilogram per day. So is it basically the total number of milligrams times the total number of square centimeters? So basically yes. it's the total number of milligrams. Um, per or is no, it's mean, multiplied. Not, yeah, but that would mean that's, that would be I'm thinking, all the way to the end. Yeah. I think you take the centimeter square out because the other part is milligrams per square centimeter times square centimeter, so it's just milligrams per kilogram per day. Go all the way to the end. Last number. Basically, milligrams per kilogram per day because you've taken milligrams per square centimeter and multiplied by square centimeter, right? Concentration is milligrams per, per meter cube. How could it be per cube? Uh, meter actually, it's not. Square, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. This is <laughs> a typo. So you, you have a calculation error. Yeah, it, it's no, it's a units error. It, it's, it's, no, it's just a typo. The, concentra the, the units are correct. Hold on. Let me just yeah, back up. Milk. Excuse? No, the... the How do you get milligrams per cubic meter no, when that's you're what I'm saying. the surface? Yeah, the, it's just a typo. I'll, I'll tell you what I the think units that I have. It's a centimeter, right? Yeah. It can't be per cubic meter. I know. I know. No, it's, it's, no it's, it's milligrams per grams. It's, that's what the concentration is. So that's the concentration of the phthalate found in that particular, you know, cosmetic product. Yeah, but you have the applied surface. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, this would be, I just want to make sure your final units of your final yes. column are correct. The way it, the the way units are listed in the final column isn't the mass seems a little weird. Yes. The final the last column milligrams slash centimeters squared. I'm it not sure what make, that those units no mean. Sense. Dermal exposure should it's be. Slash, it's, point. it's times. Yeah. Milligrams times centimeters squared divided by kilogram day. Yeah. You're going to have an absorption coefficient. Yeah. It can't be that way. I don't. I don't understand. It's usually milligrams per kilogram per day. Yeah, that's that's, that's the dose. Milligrams slash centimeters squared. The the equations that we that we got from CPSC were exactly in these units. Well, it doesn't make any sense because if you're going to compare it, it's got it's to be it, milligrams not, per kilogram per day across. So to get to the point, according to your units, there we now need to multiply these numbers by the surface area to which this stuff is applied to, to get. An exposure in milligram per kilogram a day, correct? No, I believe you have to divide it because this divide. number has already been multiplied by this number, which is the skin surface area. It makes no sense. It yeah, then that's happen. confusing. Then that really the unit should be milligram. All your units here. You have you have a you have a number of milligrams applied per surface area on the skin, cosmetic, multiplied the total, by the total number of surface that's been covered. And then you're going to have an, now leave milligrams, and you have to multiply it by the fraction of the absorbed to come up with milligrams per kilogram per day. There's something wrong here. We also have a mass over here. Hmm? We also There's have a mass. The mass is just basically, the mass is basically multiplied by the surface area. To just go again to the numbers. numbers.
Right, so we're really talking, if I read this correctly now, we're talking, um, what, one milligram per kilogram a day from, on average, the third from the bottom. Huh? Yeah. yeah whatever that is. Fragrances, uh -huh. DEP. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But do I read this correctly? Yeah, because it's direct contact and it's got a lot of a lot of mass. I mean, normally inhalation is very very small. I'll be surprised by that, Chris. I'm not surprised. Okay, can you show us an example with a non-DEP phthalate, say <laughs> DEHP? Oh, butyl DBP, yeah. Factor of a thousand. Sounds uh, reasonable to to me and Dr. Koch. <laughs> that doesn't mean anything, but <laughs> yes, <laughs> Professor Kortenkamp. <laughs> uh, you're getting down to that level. Is that just? <laughs> That's total. Is, the relationship is that strange? dermal inhalation or total? No, this is just uh, dermal. Dermal, okay. This is just. And for that particular, you know, phthalate. I can I can show you um let's see some ingestion numbers we have a lot of categories for for food um but these numbers are generally very low the range finding help Have a question? Could, could, yeah, could we just uh, for another check look at a um, look at a phthalate where expert is mostly via food to get an DHP. DHP is a good example. Yeah, so what? I'm, I'm, I'm pointing. So out what would you estimate as the total exposure via food to DHP? But this is food for an greens. average sixty kilogram weighing U.S. citizen. Um. Well, this number is based on a, a particular age, I think, uh, weight, I think it's, uh, let me see, let me go back. The weight that we used was 71.5 kilograms, yes. And uh, oh, that's a bit obese, really. <laughs> that's That's the number that we obtained from the... Is this 10-year-old children or what? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. This is only uh, the pregnant. <laughs> um, so DEHP as obtained from uh, data collected from grains, these would be the, the numbers in terms of milligrams per kilograms day, per day. What if you sum, you're going to sum up some of these for a daily? Well, yeah, we're going to come up with a daily exposure for for food. Okay. I mean, we could separate food and drinks if you want, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's the the challenge in this is is yeah. So right now we have it all you know separated, but we can easily combine it. 
Um, right, right. Sorry, can we have a look again at the units? Just what would you? Yeah, yeah. This is, uh, again, the, I, I don't think this. That's not right. Yeah, the, the, the unit was, it was meant for inhalation. I think I, I did not change it. But uh, I go back to the concentrations and select um, ingestion direct. Concentration units are milligrams per grams. That's what we, you know. But then you go to the other one. Your daily intake. Uh, that would be the factors. Uh, okay. Ingestion direct exposure, exposure factors. Right. Okay, this is, these are the, uh-huh. No, oh, no, this is the, just the factors. Uh, Top skip, one, yeah. Skip. Yeah. There is no yeah. yeah. See, that's yeah. why it should be comparable. Earlier you were highlighting on grains and it ind indicates something is amiss that we have to work on because your exposure for grains over there was like 0.2 mm -hmm. and the actual total exposure DEHP is like 3 micrograms 0 0.003 but your numbers you can just arrow down and see them you had 0.2 milligrams per so there's something amiss want to arrow down and see yeah yeah I know that was one of the high numbers. It's and it's not correct. The total, you know, even at the high end, by you know using enhanced biomonitoring, and and all the science shows that DEHP exposure is no more than 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram per day, 10 micrograms per kilogram per day. You have like 200 to 700 micrograms. No, no, this is not micrograms, this is milligrams. I know. Yeah. But 0. 0.2 milligrams yeah, is yeah, 200 yeah. micrograms. Yes, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So your your numbers are wrong somewhere for food grains. The others look in the reasonable range. Something's, something's awry with that, with that row. Okay. Yeah, and, um, you know, if I go back to my last slide, it's like, you know, we've been looking at a lot of data Right. We have yet to kind of take a step back. Well, that's that's yeah. sort of the benefit of looking at it from both ways. Yes. You do reality yes. checks, mm -hmm. and immediately my eye caught I, my eye caught that number because mm -hmm. I know that number's not right. Okay. And also, hold oh, we, we're looking at each other. <laughs> Something's not right. right. Okay. Uh, the, fi the final numbers, the final exposure numbers. I can actually do this. Um, okay. Could you not add them up and then we have an idea? If you add them up, it's going to be driven by food grains. Right. right now, we just you know kept it separate so that you know we can see, you know what the different categories are. But yes, it would be very simple to just you know aggregate it or just add it up. We're in the mood to fiddle with the data. <laughs> could you could you add up the, the, the median levels here for the food stuff? Uh, just add it up. Yeah, just yeah, sum yeah. it up. But again, I think what he said was right. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, yeah. It. This is the sum. Just sum it. Point four. Point four. Four hundred micrograms per kilogram per day, which is which we know is not. But I, sorry. Um, 
but as you say in your defense you know you're counting you're counting various food items multiple times so you yes. would have to weigh yes. right. so we can't just add up Oh, and this also includes some other things like, you know, dust. How's oh, all dust? Get rid of the dust, man. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> it's not no, it's not just food, right? We What's oral intake? Oral intake. Yeah. Well, dust for adults is going to be pretty low. Oh, <laughs> Except the ones with toys crawling on the floor. <laughs> Just to wrap up, do you have, have you gotten it to the point where you have any bill for daily intake for any of the phthalates? No, no, we you haven't. haven't started aggregating. No, okay. no. Just started, you know, getting to this, and it's been really, really challenging. So we haven't gone to the next step as yet. But, but the fact You were going to tell us about where you're going, which you haven't done yet. Are you going to be back when we return in half an hour? Do you want to... Go back to the slides. I, uh, yeah, I just have one slide, really. And okay. Too much. I mean, all I was going to say is that, you know, I was going to take down the, the suggestions that, you know, uh, you all had and then incorporate it in whatever we've done so far. But the next step, of course, would be, you know, to focus on children um, and, of course, do more uh, literature search to come up with more concentrations as well as exposure factors and um, you know do a, a thorough QAQC which is something that you know we haven't really done so much um, so. I think in the meantime the way I think we've said it is that Then, you know, like here, you're just continuing the The only thing would be that, you know, when we finish it, uh, there might be a possibility that, you know, down the line we might get some additional That's data fine. sources. Yeah. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. 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 They, need, they need to start thinking about it in terms of done, not children or young children, which you'll be doing next. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Stay in touch. Yeah. Thanks. So, do we want to talk about a time frame then? I mean, not to put you on the spot, but maybe a little bit on the spot. Of, <laughs> I mean, do we have a yeah. sense of. I mean, our time frame is to get some of this uh, as soon as possible, but the question is when, I guess, 
do you have a sense of when you might have a um, a set of data for women of childbearing age, a set of exposures? Um, if we go with the, the current concentrations that we have collected so far, which I think is probably around 800 records or something, um, we are almost through with the exposure factors for the other route. So I, I would think that we would have a, a complete data set for pregnant women maybe uh, two weeks. Okay. When can you do the calculation? Um, add another week to that, three weeks. Age when we look at the concentration, it's really all all the the phthalates, uh, and you know we always get some additional data. We haven't really put it in the equation. If you want, you can still take a look, but it should have all the eight phthalates. But it's per phthalate. Yes, yes, yes. The final numbers that we are going to get are going to be, you know, per phthalate per source. Yeah, and it's it's not going to be um, like the NHANES data. I mean, it's going to be an average of the, what, eight phthalates, an average in a 90th percentile value for each one of those. It's not going to be actual exposures on individuals like you have. No, but I mean, but we're going we're gonna to be able to see average DEHP. Yeah. Exposure about daily intake and right. a ninetieth percentile. Right. right. Mean and finite. And the cumulative exposure too. The cumulative exposure. How how would you calculate that then? Add up the nine. Like we did. We we had, uh, you know, like you calculated ninety fifth percentile. So we, well, that that we're not going to have, but what we can do is is calculate the hazard index for, you know, by adding up the average exposures for all the phthalates at the median level. Hmm? But can right, you also add up the ninety fifth or the ninetieth percent. We can now? we can do that. Yeah, because wow. it would be another approach than we did because we didn't add up. The individual 95th percentiles. We looked at each individual that added up the phthalates. Here we would add up the upper ranges of. Yeah, yeah. We can't so do. We can't approach. do that. In your way is the ideal way. Mm -hmm. Our way would be an overestimate. Right. Yeah, I just wanted to point that out. Yeah. yeah. If there are no more comments, let's uh, adjourn. We'll return in, in 20 minutes. Thank you. Okay, what I'd like to do uh, for the rest of, of today is talk about scheduling uh, our next meeting beyond the November 3rd meeting. And in order for us to, to do that, I, I think it behooves us to take some time to talk about what we're going to do between when we leave here and when we reconvene November 3rd and 4th, what we hope to accomplish at the November 3rd and 4th meeting and what we want to do to prepare for that meeting. So we have some specific goals in mind um, and whether we want to have uh, conference call or calls, uh, what kind of work products we want to have completed at what time. So um, let's uh, begin that discussion. So we've got a meeting scheduled for November 3rd and 4th. <clears throat> and at that point, um, I will 
along with, with Mike, will put together a, a complete draft of our document with all of the, the parts that, that I have at the moment. And um, then when I get more input before the November 3rd meeting, I will update that so we will have an updated version. Um, I think, Byrne, you're pretty close to having a, a, a fairly complete draft of your section, correct? Well, I've got, based on the CD that we got now, there's another 10 chemicals to look at. But it, what? if I understand correctly, they are chemicals for which there is not a large volume of data. So <clears throat> that will not be a major process to read the rest of those and get them converted into a, an abstract. and onto a table. Didn't we, didn't we get a, a CD with? But your CD has eight, eight more tox reviews. Yeah. It includes diisobutyl, uh, DPHP, and you know some of the other ones we're interested in. But we're not going beyond the, the um, ones that we have already talked about. Right, right. Right. Oh, well, then I don't. Well, then, then why, why do we have? This? Well, it includes those eight. Include, I, uh, I think are. Uh, let me find my. It includes the ones that you're that are uh, explicitly. Um, we're explicitly discussing so. Um, For completeness well they're there because we're supposed to look at quote unquote all phthalates um, I don't think anyone said you know but what do, the final ones include dimethyl diethyl this is the final eight diisobutyl and I'm looking at tab three uh, cyclohexyl Isoheptyl, isooctyl, DPHP, and some uh, mixtures C9 to 11, diondesyl and ditridesyl. And so I, the, I think the, the first seven of those anyway are, are explicitly in either the biomonitoring part or the exposure scenarios part. Okay. Well, the, I think the one, the, the different, the difference was the cyclohexyl, there just was no exposure okay. data, right. yeah. Right. I'll review those eight and have a summary statement about them. But the, the question that I have coming back, I mean, this, this morning we were thinking that <clears throat> the getting the Versar data and getting it available to, to work with the hazard index evaluation was a, uh, maybe a slower, slower step in the train here. But we know, not, we know more now than we did this morning. Mm -hmm. So what, based on what we heard about the Versar data, how, how how does that affect our thoughts about scheduling now? What can we be, have done by November now that we know a little more firmly when new information is coming? I'm, 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 I'm confused now about, I thought we had decided specifically on which phthalates we were going to be focusing on, and we seem to have changed that. And in terms of the hazard index analysis, which is one of the major um, propellers of what is going to lead to our recommendation, um, 
lot of those 10 on this new on tab 3 don't appear. So I, guess I, I don't think we have any intention of adding those to, to that hazard index analysis. So, but in, in the spirit of what Mike said about looking more broadly at the phthalates, <clears throat> I think now that we have these in hand, I would spend a day or whatever the time is to go through them and summarize them and see if there are any surprises there. Okay. That would cause us concern. Do that and for the developmental talks as well. You want me to look at both? No, I mean I would oh. do. I would do. Okay. So then we'll at least have that part behind us, even though it doesn't draw more exposure data or more hazard index evaluation. We'll at least be able to say that yes, we did look we're more broadly the than the 14 that we were looking at we're, specifically we're for eight. regulatory decisions. Okay. But what I was getting at in my other part of my comment was now that we. Are more sure that the Versar data are going to be coming more quickly than we might have thought. What impact does that make on the hazard index evaluation with having the exposure scenario data right behind it? Does, does it allow us to for sure be able to have a meeting in November and talk about these two in a fairly final stage? Yeah, I, I, I think Kristen Holger's contribution is really going to drive the next meeting. Mm -hmm. And would it be helpful then to have a conference call of an hour or two sometime in late September yes. to be able to, to keep things on track and make sure that both of these parts and the rest of us move simultaneously so that by November we have it, we have it all in hand. Mm -hmm. So that would be my proposal for what might come in before the November meeting. And so the goal would be by that conference call to have a pretty final draft of, of this hazard index section. Maybe that's being too optimistic. At least by the end of September, have a fairly good feel where the eight phthalates that we're looking at fit in terms of exposure scenarios with respect to what you will be doing in terms of evaluating them for daily intake from the biomarking data. We may not have a report. You may not have a finalized report, but you at least will know where, where you sit. So some of that's going to depend on when I can get tables for you guys. Yes. Yep. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, yeah. we... We should have tables well before November. Yes. Well, based on what Versar said, they should be able to provide something within three weeks to a month. Right. That, little that little was bit. the first uh, population women of right. childbearing right. age. And, and then that at least gives Chris something to. Yeah. Uh, and then actually, they should be essentially done by October. Right. Um, with data, then their actual, you know, the written report take, will take a little longer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So of the, of the ones that there remain, the most important ones are the young children, the children and the women of childbearing age slash pregnant women. They're going to do adults, but that to me is a lower priority. Correct? Correct. So, um, yeah. So, the two main ones for them to focus on are those two groups first, and then tidy up with the adults that Holger and Chris can finish their job. I regret saying this, but um, we don't have to necessarily match all of those cases, right? No. right? In the sense of, I, I had assumed, and maybe to include in the hazard index pregnant women. Uh, from in Haines and from the mm -hmm. Shauna Swan pre right. and postnatal and infants. But the children that, that we actually had done earlier, I removed just because it seemed to me that wasn't the focus of what the Consumer Product Safety Commission was interested in. I think we have young children in. Children in, in the children in Haines was, you know, 6 to 12 and 12 to 18. That we're, seemed to me we're out in of the, the range. Yeah, but the exposure work we're doing right now 
has to include the young children. Young children, we've got the infants zero to three. And that's that's what we're going and I think that's what we're going to be including. Mm -hmm. But the older children, six to eighteen, it's. I mean, that doesn't seem to me seem bulky to me when I was putting all of it. Bulky. Out. I mean, how do you mean bulky? Well, I mean, all of the all of the work for the um, six to eighteen children that didn't seem to me the point of what we were getting to. So it just seemed like it. True. Well, that's true. You I put mean, it in if you think it needs we, to be well, we office. wrote into the for the exposures <clears throat> that Versar is doing. We said zero to three, and then three to twelve, where mm -hmm. you know the the mothers would be the first priority, infants zero to three second, and then the other you know children three to twelve and adults are are a, a lower priority. The other two are the main priorities. Yeah. Children. In our chapter, do we need to have all of those cases? Well, no, no, no. It's it depends on what you have data to do mm -hmm. support. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that it's the, the first two the, groups. Yeah, are the most important anyway. Yeah. Do we have? To, are we going to have to include those? I, I mean, I don't remember me being very. Um, Adamant about the older groups. Is I mean, I wrote some? I wrote it in for really for completeness. Fine. But okay, so that may not be part of the final report because it may not be because it's just just a lot of information yeah. that may not have any relevance. Yeah. Chris, so basically, what you'll get is what you need. Basically, what you'll get is what you need. Okay. Because the rest of the analyses are being done for completion's sake, and they may not even be in the appendix of the final report because, in a sense, they're going to deflect from what we're, our charge is. At least they'll have it for future reference for other yeah. things they want to do. Correct? Correct. And, okay. by the way, I mean, they're doing all that work. Might as well get it done. Might as well do the whole thing. But these are, this is what I put together a while back, uh -huh. and... I believe these are the phthalates of interest to the panel, and I didn't get any comments saying to the contrary. These are the 14 that I was talking about this morning. And we're doing eight in the exposure assessment. We're doing eight in the exposure <coughs> assessment. And one we couldn't do because there's no data. And if you look on this list, they're there either because they're in the CPSIA, they're in the biomonitoring data, uh, or they're known, you know, the, the pental is there because it's known to induce the phthalate syndrome. That list um, workbook? In, in, in the book, in tab... Was it five? Tab five, at the end of tab five, those tables are, these are the ones that I highlighted in green on the tables. Highlighted in light green all the way across. The light green all the way across. Mm -hmm. hmm. right. Yeah. So, um, back to your suggestion, the end of September for a conference call, I think it would be cool. Good. <clears throat> so, let me just be a little more specific. So, I need to, to give you some Noels on the developmental talks. If I did that and Versar got the information to you by the end of August. Or early September. Would you be prepared to have a conference call the middle of September? So, yeah, I mean, so what I'd like to do, so that gets back to the reproductive and developmental talks, 
you know. Yeah, we'll we'll sort that guys, out. So when you say you're going to give me developmental, it's, yeah, so you guys it's will sorted out. It, yes. One, so there'll be one case. You guys will define. Yep. A case, the reference doses for a case. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's and that'll be good. So if you give me that by, did you say the end of end of August? And the Versar data. And the Versar data, mainly what we'll do is just plot it with our, with like reference num lines. Yeah. It's with our histograms, right? I would say we, we first happens. look at the data, <coughs> check it, double check it, and then. Sure. That's, but in terms of what we'll do, you know, there's a lot of discussion about it, but in terms of some work done between on the conference call, we just want to essentially see is it in the ballpark. Right. <clears throat> so do we want to have a conference call on the 15th of September? That's a Thursday. Starts. All begins now. I can do the um, God, 21st. And we, and we got the issue of time during the day as well. Has to be morning, I think, to accommodate our European colleagues. I can I can get up fairly early, so. <clears throat> what are we talking about now? So twenty first of this is September. It's Wednesday. a Wednesday. Actually, correction. Uh, you can take a pick: nineteenth or twentieth. That's better. Nineteenth or twentieth. Either one works for me. Twentieth is better for me. Twentieth. Mm -hmm. Russ? Okay. September 20th. What time? What time do you think? Then I guess we'll leave it up to Mike to figure out a, a time based on all the different time zones. Uh, last time we started at noon Eastern time. Just that that would make it, I think, nine a.m. Mind. I was I was earlier than that my time because I remember I had to get up. What? Okay, is that? Uh, yeah. No, you're thinking about the la the last chat meeting where you had to get up. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's yeah. 9 a.m. my time. Okay, that's fine. How long? It's 12 a.m. my time. Yep. It's 12 p.m. Twelve to one. And if it's not, we can always schedule another one. Earlier. You can start 11:30. Is it okay with with you and Eve? 8:30 is fine with me. 11:30. Start at 11:30. Got it. Okay. 11:30. That'll be on the 20th. Mm -hmm. And then. Um, I'd like to have a, a date certain when each of us will have uh, updates again on our individual work products. And I'd like that to be before we meet so that each of us has time to provide feedback to all the other authors so that we don't spend time at the meeting trying to, to read through a long document. Um, so, um, 
what about October, the middle of October, having uh, updates on our work products? Month. Yeah. That's only a couple of weeks. Only three weeks. The expectation is we would have our updates emailed to Mike and Michael then forward them to all of us. Uh, we will then read them and provide feedback prior to the meeting and uh, we can discuss issues at the meeting. Um, I would think that the the major item for discussion at the November 3rd and 4th meeting will be again uh, Exposure be basically you because we'll have given you all the data and be a matter of it'll be combined. Yes. Uh, combined, yes. yes. Back and combined forth. analysis. Yeah. Back and forth. Hopefully we'll begin to develop that part of your document that is now blank. When are we gonna have October twentieth? <laughs> September twentieth. Summary. No, October twentieth. That's when when updates of our sections Burn. are due. With our call or how far can we get in the November meeting on a discussion of recommendations the preliminary discussion of recommendations that's that's going to I think flow from the discussion that we have but we, I think that should be that must be the aim for the November meeting at least we'll have some arguments no no arguments none complete okay. agreement <laughs> Total agreement. A love-in instead. <laughs> For example, if we dis if we have discussion about data and process on the third, uh, commit all of the fourth to our preliminary discussion of recommendations. Mm -hmm. So that's that, reasonable. So that we don't put it on a back burner. Hmm. What? And I think another issue that we would want to address at that meeting would be the, the other sections of, of the um, report that we haven't yet started. And I have a suggestion <coughs> along that line, Phil. <clears throat> we have this two or so page description that we developed back in July about what we thought at that time would be the contents of the final report. Mm -hmm. Could we get a copy of that so that we could look at that either yet this afternoon? I mean, a copy think, on the screen I think would be okay. We have, we have that under tab eight. We have it here. Because mine, mine, is, two. mine is within the yeah. entire. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's in tab. It's also in tab four. I think we should review that one more time to see if there are parts in here that we don't think now fit the structure of the report or if there are some that we missed that we would need to add in there so that we make sure we have a complete list and assignments for the report. Everybody go to tab four. Let's, let's go through that at this point. I mean, the one... Uh, the first part is the executive summary. That that's something that that Byrne and I uh, have agreed to to write, and then with input from from the committee, and and obviously that's going to be driven. That'll be a, something that's written fairly late in the, in the program. Um, introduction and background. That's well on underway. Um, Human exposure scenario that's underway we, with Paul. 
Do we have, why yep. do we have it twice? What's that? It's listed twice. One under the background, just going to be a, a short statement, and then the actual results will be in the. Because you have it twice. What, what, what do we have twice? I think the set. I think the second one is where it's combined with the biomonitoring and, and so on. Yeah, well, the first one is in the introduction and background, but that's not the result. Where is it this? Sorry, I still don't know what, where, what you're talking about. You where have, does what fit? You have in the no. section, which is the report, correct? Under you have introduction and background. Mm -hmm. All right. Then under that, there's a place, a subheading, human exposure scenarios. Mm -hmm. Correct. Then below that, there are a whole bunch of detailed subsections under exposure scenarios. I don't understand where that fits to begin with, because it's a subsection of human exposure. And then you come back to risk assessment and scenario-based exposures comes back again. Why is First, why is human exposure scenarios a category that is above toxicology of phthalates, which I think is confusing? And then the other one is under risk assessment, you have exposure, scenario based exposures a second time. By, these, by the way, this thing is set up. Toxicology be its own heading? If we, if we could go to tab eight. I, Okay. I don't know. I'm I don't think this this organization is what we settled on. I think tab eight is. Oh. It's more important. Is yeah. What we settled on. No, because so, tab eight has bait and transport, and I said that's ridiculous. We're not dealing with that in this report. That that may be. I thought we had eliminated that, and we were back to the other one. Okay, I'm confused. Here we have charge to the chap, regulatory history. I think that's uh, Mike has done that. Yes, and human exposure, environmental fate. I think is whatever it is that you're going to put down it exposure scenarios or whatever it is that you are going to have text about. I don't know, I'm confused because human exposure is above it. With why don't we separate it this way? Internal exposure issues, which is basically the biomonitoring results, and then you have the external exposure issues, which is basically what we're doing now. Okay, because that's the forward versus the backwards. The back end is biomonitoring, the front end is the other way we're doing it. So or, or can we not call it human exposure, then section A, source modeling, which is what you do, section source B. Source to receptor and then receptor to, to exposure, which is Yeah, and then, and then biomonitoring. Yeah, let's do it that way. Instead of having two sets, I think I like that idea. Okay, so under human exposure, you're going to do one is from source to human receptor, and the other one's from human receptor back to wherever, which is basically biomonitoring. How do you want to describe that, Holger? <coughs> Good title for that. Think yeah. about it. Yeah. It'll be the think about it title. Well, then we'll cross out okay. environmental fate, right? Yeah, because that has nothing to do with what we're... And then you should add epi A after the human exposure epidemiology. So the new D is human epi. Yeah. Okay. We kicked out D, environmental fate, and the new D is human epidemiology. epidemiology. Right. That works out fine. Isn't that number three under human exposure? No. no that's epidemiology. So human exposure has one and two. One and two. And then D is... Separate section. Separate se section?
toxicology before the human? Because we'll need to draw upon yes, it. I think that makes yeah. sense. I, they're going to explain the phthalate syndrome, yeah. and I'm not going to really in the human section. I'm going to refer to it and try to draw parallels between what you see in the human data. Well, you, can and have, you can have toxicology after exposure and then have epi after toxicology. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, as long as epi follows the toxicology. Let's have epi after, after toxin. That'll be sufficient. Now, in the um, the biomonitoring part, they're integrating the exposure and the risk calculations, essentially. So I'm wondering if... No. Oh, it's it's only biomonitoring, nothing to do with risk at this point. Even the the hazard index? No, that comes later. Okay, that okay. comes later. <laughs> Can I make suggestions that we discussed this morning where to put the metabolism stuff? I, I think in order to bring the biomonitoring bit to life, or yeah, well, the biomonitoring would need information on metabolism, wouldn't it? Should we not stick it somewhere before? Well, isn't the bio, when, when you look at the biomonitoring in terms of a hazard index, that's when it needs metabolism. The other one you're just presenting, I'm confused. I would say the validity, validity of biomarkers has something to do with knowledge on human metabolism. Yeah. Okay. So for me, metabolism is part of the biomonitoring section. The issue I had with, with Russ was the comparison between animals and humans. So that's another issue. So in my part, human biomonitoring, I will focus on human metabolism the same, the same and the validity of the biomarkers I use or we use in urine. Russ, we might think about some passages in your chapter about the comparison between animal models, animal metabolism. Yeah, I was, I was mostly commenting, I think, on metabolism differences within animal species, potentially ex explaining differences between the rat model, marmoset, et cetera, and less so between the animal species and human. But Would we not need um, a separate section on species differences as part of the um, big toxicology part, and then we can slip it in there. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Does that make sense, Phil? I'm, I'm sorry, I was looking ahead. So, so, so was I. Um, I was looking ahead to the toxicology part, and uh, my proposal is to make a new subsection there after everything, uh, we could call it species differences. And in that context, deal with both the toxicodynamic aspects of species differences, but also with the differences in metabolism as far as they you know, inform the differences in, um, in toxicodynamics. You're going to write that? No, I'm not. Um, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said anything, really. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just proposing this. I'm not expert there. Yes. Your species differences. Tell me again what you're, what you're referring to. So and the species differences, we need to deal with the question, uh, you know, what there are obviously differences between the rat, the mouse, the marmoset. Mm -hmm. That needs to be described. I've, I've covered that to some extent. You, that is right. You've already covered this. Response. What am I talking about? I'm lapsing here. I'm really... I'm jet lag. But as part of this, we could... That's my proposal. We could put, again, metabolism, but this time in, in animals, uh, in just briefly, like Russ suggested, in order to see to what degree it informs these species differences. Mm, yeah. Could be a, a half a page or a page. It's, I don't think you need a lot.
And Holder, in, in the biomonitoring, you're going to to write about and comment on the use of some of the metabolites as a biomonitoring for the diester and how some are minor metabolites and, and others may not fully capture the exposure, specifically thinking about some of the earlier diisononal metabolites? I think I will compile some introductory remarks on why do we do biomonitoring in urine and not in blood? What is the matrix of biomonitoring? And then, of course, what is the choice of biomarkers, valid biomarkers? But I want to make, it, make this as short and general as possible, because I could write books about that. That probably doesn't help <clears throat> us. If you could turn to page 36 under tab 8, where I have number 2, Human and Hauser, I'm proposing to make that section E, Epidemiology, Hauser. Then there are subsections in that you can modify as you fit in terms of subsections. So I don't know. We came up with those. I'm not sure. Um, then the, the number three, that should be now, I think, F. Talked about selection of toxicity endpoints and sensitive life stages, <clears throat> basis for prediction of human risk. Um, I'm still. <laughs> I was given that assignment, but I'm still not sure what um, would go in there. Um, I'll talk, I'll discuss that with Bernie. So then we go to the next section, which is risk assessment of exposure to phthalates. So individual and cumulative exposure, Andreas, your section would, part of it would go there. There's also section C, other antiandrogens. Um, you can either divide it up or or not. Um. Yeah, can I suggest to change that? First of all, uh, you know, the, all of a sudden the um, um, lettering changes from A, B, C, D, E, F to Roman numeral, yeah, so, yeah. but that's a minor thing. Can, can I propose a new section G, simply called uh, something like experimental results phthalate mixtures? So we have the, the empirical, the experimental studies in one in one section and then um, so this would uh, we could strike out this uh, point number a individual and cum cumulative exposures with my name behind it move that and make this a section G but in, uh, entitled something like experimental experimental evidence mixture effects I'll invent a nicer title That'll include phthalates and antiandrogens? Yeah. So we're going to strike then A. We could also strike B because most probably the phthalate substitutes will be discussed by you with the tox data. And as there is no exposure data, I have problems to make a risk assessment. So in the end, we'll just stick with the tox data that's there, and there's nothing to discuss. With the epi, there's there's no epi. Okay, fair enough. Uh, just a, another suggestion concerning the other antiandrogen. To make it more logical, um, can I propose to include that as a subsection of toxicity? That's your chapter, Phil. I'm, I'm but, sorry, again, I was thinking of something else. No. I'm, I'm the, focused now. The, 
the toxicity uh, effects for other antiandrogens, can we put this under your section, toxicity of phthalates? That would sit there lo more logically than under mixtures. Yeah? But I can, I can write something briefly. That would be good because I'm. That's not something I'm at all familiar with. That would go it doesn't have to be an exhaustive uh, review, but just some stuff. Okay. Uh, to back up a second for the phthalate substitutes, we have data. We can make exposure estimates for children's toys. Um, I don't know about anything else, but we can can do that. I think we have d uh, data for that. But then again, it wouldn't be in my field of expertise. I, I, I wouldn't mind doing it together with Paul. Yeah. Or you could well, we'll, I think we should leave it in and doesn't necessarily have to be you. Are we now in the risk assessment chapter? Deep? Yes. Deep. 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 Wouldn't it make sense to begin this with the usual classical approach everyone loves so very much and everyone's very familiar with, i.e. chemical by chemical? That could then provide the basis for doing the cumulative. No. Yeah. So under two risk assessment, you want to start off with chemical by chemical. B would be cumulative. Okay, we've got biomonitoring data. Is that going to be something that needs to stand alone? That's how we described it before, or is that going to be incorporated? And aren't we just doing now a risk assessment? Yeah. Where we take the results from what Holger and Chris have done, validated by the exposure scenarios, and yeah, absolutely. then yeah which is the ADI and then calculate a risk. So I think the biomonitoring D, biomonitoring data, Koch, doesn't sit there very well. It has been dealt with already or the should scenario-based exposure yeah. has been dealt with too. Yeah. So where has the biomonitoring data been dealt with? In chapter, way back. Where? Way back at the beginning. beginning? In, under human exposure, A was. Oh, biomonitoring, yes, you're right. Yep. yep. Right? On. Right, because we've already done those. So then we have <coughs> the hazard index calculations. Hazard index approach. But I, before we go there, because hazard in there are various uh, different approaches possible for doing cumulative risk assessment, and I think we would have to justify why we went for the hazard index. This requires a little overview of what could be done in cumulative risk assessment and then a focusing in on, on hazard index. And if my, if my esteemed colleagues to my left um, <laughs> would agree, I can volunteer writing this blurb. <laughs> Number three, we have results of the hazard index evaluation. Mm -hmm. Four, impact of variabilities and uncertainties. And that's uh, where we, we've started a parking lot. List these, and that's probably going to expand. We have discussion, and conclusions, and recommendations, and that's going to be I think those sections at this point, unless you think otherwise, Byrne, we're going to have to leave until after the third meeting.
executive summary? Uh, normally, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Based on this discussion, I will put together a revision of this outline and send it around and, okay. and please then revise that based on your understandings and we'll come to a, okay. a final consensus. Mm -hmm. Penultimate final consensus. Yeah. <laughs> and eventually an ultimate. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so um, then, We need to talk about, uh, so we have a pretty good idea of where we're going to be at the end of the November 3rd and 4th. When do we want to meet subsequent to that meeting? Somewhere warm. How about Bermuda? Okay. Or the <laughs> Germany. I don't know if that's... Been out in the sun too long. Yeah. Burn, it, Burn has made the argument to me that January, having tough. three months between meetings is too long. We you kind of, oh, three months I don't have to do anything for a while. I can put it off, and all of a sudden it's two weeks and before the meeting, and you haven't done anything. So. Um, and plus, we're, we're really bumping up against our, our deadline, which may be firmer than we thought. So. About another conference call. We're going, to, we're going to develop those at the November 3rd and 4th meeting. And so we're going to then chew on those after we leave and d discuss those again in a conference call. That would, that, would, and that would force us to work our way through the full range of recommendations in November so that we would see them all in context by early December. And then we would still have a meeting in January, February time frame that would, at that point, we would be depending on EPSC staff to pull together a text of all the pieces that we've given them and make a report out of it. Is that right, Mike? That would be our first shot at a draft report. Yeah, when, when, so that would be for January, February, yeah. sure. And the April meeting would be a final review and, and <clears throat> kind of giving final approval of the recommendations and revising whatever text we need to go with that. Okay, so we're talking about there's a proposal to have a conference call in December. That's a good idea. Um, availabilities? Bill? <clears throat> We're coming down to a last chance of having anybody come and speak to us if we want. If there are other speakers that we want to have brought in, we about have to plug it in now. Well, that was what we were going to do at the November 3rd and 4th meeting, right? Should they, if we want more information, should they not be invited for the November meeting? Yes, I think so. Yeah, I agree with the timing, but I really don't want to take a half day or so for outside speakers. If, if we could compress that, so that we still have plenty of time to hear the business that we need to from our own deliberations, that's fine, if we can do that. 
<clears throat> but I think for what we have in mind, half a day should do it. As we're talking about him and Earl and Paul and Richard. And there's also the option of, of having a three rather than a two-day meeting in November. I'll be coming back from Europe. Be lucky if I get here on time on the third. We're gonna have more talks. I I I, I tend to object to that. I, I'd rather keep us to our business and get it done. I I just don't see where it's gonna. Observation. We need we need clarification on the species difference issue. That's pretty important. And we still need another clarification from CPSC about whether or not we can have a meeting after April. Because if we, if we could slip that one if we, if we could request to have permission for one more meeting after April then we could have a half day to, to listen and still get our work done but wouldn't it be better then I mean I appreciate Paul you you're coming back from Europe well, but, that's but not, that's not it wouldn't concern. it be better then to in November have a three-day meeting it's ultimately more effective isn't it I think that you need to have the species differences. You will need these. Fine. Yep. You would be here for the important parts that yeah. relate to your input. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So let's get back to then the the conference call in in December. Um, what about the twelfth? Uh, it's, it's a Monday, Monday, Monday the 12th. Uh, what is November? Monday the 12th of December. Two, three, and four. Not sure. Two, three, and four. Yeah, it's going to be. <clears throat> Middle of the day, I could probably make the 12th. So do we start early on the 2nd, or is it... Uh, Are we talking about the 2nd of November? Oh, okay. Let me just look. You know, would that make a difference for travel reasons? For you guys, probably wouldn't. Not for me. Yeah. For Holger and Andreas, it wouldn't make a difference either. If if we then could fly back, uh, say Friday night, that would be good. Half day at the back end. Yeah, well, I mean, Friday's not a full day, but we can make it. You know, leave at noon or whatever. All of lights are from three to seven, three to nine. That's okay. Yeah. Okay, so we're all on board with uh, having it. I have a student committee meeting on the second from twelve thirty to two, but I think I could move it given how far out we are. Okay. So we'll have a full day the second and third. And when would you want would you want to have the speakers start in the morning? Now that's a miss. morning of the second if you know that's compatible with their schedules. That's another issue. 
hopefully this far out, that won't be a problem. But. And now we, we've got on the table a proposal for December 12th for a conference call. Fine, fine with me. 11.30 again. 8.30 my time. Okay. How long would that be? <laughs> I would think, you think burn an hour, most? <laughs> <laughs> Thirty. Perfect. Okay. So, based on that, scheduling the next meeting. And we may get an answer tomorrow on the CPSC <coughs> deadline of April. Get a firm answer either way, then we'll have to work around that again. Uh, let's see. Well, should we t schedule the meeting for? I mean, I think, I mean, I'm wondering even if we do some form of peer review, if we couldn't still make the deadline. That was the essence of the discussion that Paul and I had yeah. this morning. That this this isn't a global review of the whole document by peers. It's a focused review by a small number of risk assessment types to look at whether or not the bigger picture fits together. Ann was interested in relaying that message back. Grace, do you have a problem with that? Because I think that's a little bit less cumbersome and deals with the critical issue no, of, of I, putting I, it all together. Because you weren't involved this morning. You were out of the room when we started talking about the, well, the type of peer review. I think I was there, maybe. We were in the back. We were, we were over in the... the maybe uh, I was invisible, but really I was there. <laughs> maybe you were invisible. I have no problem. I, I have okay. no problem with okay. that whatsoever. Okay. Okay, if, if let's, let's talk about a, a January meeting, and first of all, what we would accomplish at that meeting. January. Um, January. Snow. Yeah. Big time. Temperature may have been 101 two days ago, but it's going to be. Snow. We're going to be facing that possibility in February and March. <laughs> so. Um, I think Burns' plan was that by January, February, we'll be talking about, we'll be on, be beyond the basics and the results, and we'll be talking about the, the recommendations and discussion and all that stuff. Yeah, because at the conference call, we were going to be dealing with recommendations, and, and so that the January meeting, I think, would really be focusing on finalizing those, correct, Burns? If, if we get permission and decide to have this peer review, when are we going, when will we initiate it, at what stage, after the December 12th meeting? After the December 12th conference call, could we have enough of a draft report to give to these three or four reviewers? 
really. In other words, we have to have our final evaluation of the report in this January meeting right. and then put it out for peer review. I think and that would be reasonable. Length, and then whatever length of time it takes that peer review to be completed and get the comments back to us, that's when we would have the last meeting to look at our final report again in the context of reviewers' comments and make recommendations for how to make that final revision and that would be our last meeting. What, a, what about a meeting the second week of January, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th? Not Pardon? Not a good week. Toward the end of the month. And we're pushing ourselves in terms of getting that report to the external reviewers. Got a lot of deadlines. Six, that's the 16th. Right. That's a hard week. To start up with classes again. It's not an easy week. for you <laughs> well let's pencil it in see how it goes 19th and 20th January 19th it's just a long way away for a two-day meeting here in mm -hmm. person purposes to get the purposes to get the final report at a stage where we can send it out to peer reviews mm-hmm the prospect of having the last meeting in April to make whatever accommodations, revisions we want to make as a group to the final report based on the report from or the comments from the reviewers. At that point, we'll discuss you know how long we want to give the external reviewers. Yeah. Do their job. That will allow us to do our remaining job and that will depend on whether we have an yeah. extension or not right but don't we want to have the reports back to us oh. yes in time for the April meeting. yeah and that's going to depend on whether we get an extension or not I, I'm just guessing what we're going to get out of this review but my guess would be that they would probably not take us on in terms of our recommendations I would be surprised if they would second guess our recommendation for an interim ban or a restriction or something they're more I mean if we ask them to to review how well the pieces fit together they're probably not going to say you shouldn't abandon that phthalate. They're more likely to focus their comments on how how we rationalized our decisions. And I think that's what we want. Well, I, I think as we said this morning, we want to get some very um, specific questions to ask them. Yeah. So we are dealing with the issues that we need to have looked at in terms of integration and in terms you know, the the, our recommendations are our recommendations. Now they could say that the basis for it 
based upon what they saw in the risk assessment or the hazard analysis may have a flaw in it and we should go back and review yes. it. And in that case, we go back and review and then it's our decision as to whether or not we modify our conclusions and recommendations. I think what we're looking to make sure they, they look and make sure that what we've done is appropriate to lead to conclusions that we got but not the recommendations yeah. that we make. Hey, Mike, you. I think we've we've got the way forward planned. Yeah, yeah, I think we have a good plan, and we'll try to get more, try to get an answer before we by tomorrow, hopefully. Um, as to whether uh, or not uh, an extension might be possible. Mm -hmm. If your general counsel wants to talk to us, I would suggest that we should be available for, the, for your general counsel. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I think she knows that. Yep. Any other comments, questions? not I move we adjourn for today and return tomorrow at nine nine o'clock tomorrow or mm -hmm.